I'm greatly looking forward to uh, being the new director of FVD International. <laughs> the goal is twofold, Thierry has just said. Uh, the first goal is to organize events like this, where we will consolidate and increase FVD's reputation as the most interesting, cutting edge, thoughtful party in Europe, in Europe, probably the world. And international, <clears throat> also of course in the sense that you've just said, Thierry, uh, bringing uh, FVD's ideas and activities out into the open. As you know, uh, Thierry and his fantastic team uh, in the Tweede Kammer bring uh, issues onto the table which are not discussed in any other country. And uh, the big goal, therefore, is to bring these things uh, out uh, into the world, into English above all, uh, so that people understand the importance of FVD. It's a delight to see you all, and it's it, deeply impressive to see how, so many of you here. Thank you for coming. I'd like to open the evening on China uh, by giving a bit of context, a bit of historical and, if you don't mind, philosophical context to the situation that we're in. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows George Orwell. Everybody knows how Orwell, uh, with phenomenal lucidity and foresight, predicted the totalitarian world in which we live now. He predicted uh, a world in which our own television screens would listen to us, these things, would listen to us, know where we are, and be able to follow us and, uh, in some cases, even control us. He predicted that in 1948. It's an extraordinary achievement, and that's why uh, we all continue to read him today. But there's another prediction that George Orwell made, which most people miss, many people miss. And it comes at the end of Animal Farm. The prediction about the television screens is in 1984. I'm not sure if you remember, but the last lines of Animal Farm are prophetic. Animal Farm is an allegory of the Bolshevik Revolution. It tells the story of how the animals in a farm throw off the reign of the farmers, expel the farmers, and establish their own regime. And quickly, of course, the regime becomes dictatorial. It's taken over by the pigs, and the pigs uh, symbolize in the book uh, the new communist elite, which is even more dictatorial than the old farmer's regime. But the last line of uh, Animal Farm is almost, I would say, even more prophetic uh, than the elements that we know in 1984. Do you remember what it was? At the end of Animal Farm, the farmers come back. The pigs invite the farmers back. There's a reconciliation between communism, embo uh, embodied by the pigs, and capitalism, embodied by the farmers. The farmers come back into the farmhouse, and the poor working animals, symbolizing, of course, ordinary people, are left outside in the cold. And they start to play cards, and they fight, and so on, but ultimately, they are together. The communists and the capitalists, if I use the old Cold War vocabulary, come back together. And the last line of Animal Farm is, the animals outside looked in, and their eyes moved from man to pig, and from pig to man, and from, ma and from uh, man to pig back again, and already it was impossible to tell which was which. In other words, he foresaw that communism and capitalism, once again, I'm using the old vocabulary, would ultimately merge back into one system. And that is where we are today. That is where we are today. And this merging of communism and capitalism, again, I hesitate to use these words, but they are the words of the Cold War, didn't happen by chance. 
It wasn't a tactical decision uh, by uh, the two sides, the two former enemies, to make up and to put bygones, make bygones be bygones and to, and to declare peace. No. The convergence is a, has a far deeper and far more important cause. And the cause is this. It is that, as I'm sure many of you in this room know, Marxism was never discredited in Western Europe. Marxism throughout the whole of the Cold War flourished in Western Europe. It wasn't, of course, in power, but it flourished in the universities, in schools, uh, in the media, for generations. Uh, and whereas, of course, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, Marxism was totally discredited, instead, uh, at the end of the Cold War, it transmogrified itself in the West and adopted uh, an apparently new philosophy. Now, China has played a very specific role in this coming together of, Marx, of, uh, of capitalism and communism. Uh, the the, this, this, the non-discrediting of Marxism was symbolized, I think, uh, in an absolutely overwhelming way in 2018, when the previous president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, spoke at a ceremony to erect a statue, a big bronze statue of Karl Marx, which had been donated by China and now stands in the town square of Trier, in Germany, Karl Marx's birthplace. The president of the European Commission part was, the, was the principal speaker at this moment when China brought Marx. We are putting up statues to Marx in Western Europe while they have been torn down in Eastern Europe for a generation. And as I say, China, who, dominated this, who, who donated this uh, statue of Marx, has played a very key role in this because when I said just now that Marxism remained uh, dominant in uh, cultural and intellectual circles in Western Europe, there are, of course, different currents of Marxism. There were some Marxist uh, intellectuals and public figures who were favorable to the Soviet Union. But there was also a large section of the left which was not favorable to the Soviet Union for various reasons, in particular, Trotskyites and Maoists. And while many of you, and it's certainly my case, might associate Mao with the most terrible of all communist atrocities, even in comparison to Stalin, the fact is that Maoism was highly influential. And people who were Marxist but not pro-Soviet were heavily supported in the West as part of the Cultural Cold War. There's a fabulous book on the Cultural Cold War by an English historian called Frances Stoner Saunders, and she explains how the Western security services in their uh, war of ideas specifically targeted left-wingers whom they wanted, of course, to, to not to be pro-Russian, not to be pro-Soviet. There was no point targeting the right-wingers because the right-wingers were anti-communist anyway. So these people were given an extra push. They were given funding and so on. I'll just give you two examples of the kind of people I'm talking about. You've definitely heard of the first one, José Manuel Barroso, who was the president of the European Commission before Juncker. In 1974, in the Carnation Revolution uh, in Portugal, Juncker was the leader of the reorganized party of the proletariat, which is the Maoist Communist Party of Portugal. He then went on, his career is very symbolic. He went on to be uh, a mega globalist by being the president of the European Commission. And guess what he does now? He's a director of Goldman Sachs. Another figure, uh, perhaps less well known in the Netherlands, but extremely well known in France where I live, is Bernard-Henri Lévy, who is the foreign minister of France and has been the foreign minister of France for about 30 years. He did the Bosnian war, he did the Libyan war, he wanted the Syrian war, he wants war against Russia and so on. He is a former Maoist. 
So China, during the Cold War, played an important role in preparing this convergence. All right? Now, I mentioned a change that happened in Marxism. This change took place at the time of the end of the Cold War. What happened was that <clears throat> uh, certain Marxists, a certain section of the left, uh, the, particularly the anti-Soviet left, realized or came to the conclusion that the Soviet Union was a reactionary power. They were, of course, revolutionaries. They were progressives. The Soviet Union was a reactionary power. Why? Because the Soviet Union refused globalization. It refused the world financial market. It refused trade. It had, we all know, a planned economy. That was one of the main reasons why this section of the left hated the Soviet Union. Because the, those people wanted Marxist internationalism through globalization. And they got out their copies of the Communist Manifesto and they reread it. And what did they find there? They find Marx and Engels explaining that the most powerful revolutionary force in the world is capitalism. It's capitalism which turns, tears down nations. It's capitalism which tears down families. You can, you can read the passages uh, for yourself. Uh, the bourgeoisie has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and so on. There are long, long passages in the Communist Manifesto explaining this. And they read this and they thought, my God, he's right. If we're going to have one world, if we're going to have internationalism, never forget Marx and Engels said the worker has no country. The worker has no country. If we're going to have that, we have to have globalization. Well, again, I don't need to tell you, China has played an absolutely fundamental role in uh, being an actor in the last 30 years of globalization. And uh, we saw the importance, the absolutely crucial importance of China in this respect shortly after the election of Donald Trump. Trump had been in the White House for about three weeks when Xi Jinping was invited to Davos, your favorite international forum. <laughs> Why was Xi Jinping invited to Davos? He was invited to Davos in order for the globalists to say we are not going to have Trumpian, American for America first, protectionism. And he was, of course, welcomed at Davos. He was welcomed in such a servile way that uh, even uh, some of the uh, Davos men present, Davos men and women present, were embarrassed because Schwab was so, um, was so servile towards him. Schwab said, the international community is looking to China to continue its responsive and responsible leadership, if you please, in providing all of us with confidence and stability. So China was the globalist's guard dog, if you like, against the man causing trouble in the United States of America. And uh, if you haven't, I mentioned it in July, but if you haven't read, yet read uh, Thierry's book on the Het Corona Betroch, please read it. That's some of the most interesting passages uh, in that book explain uh, how uh, Chinese influence was then absolutely uh, decisive in locking us all down. The lockdowns and all the other repressive measures came from China. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it now. You can look it up in the book. Uh, in other words, what we had in Davos was uh, the convergence that I talked about when I began mentioning Animal Farm. It embodies exactly that convergence, the pigs and the men, and you can't tell one from the other. Davos, by the way, uh, we refer to the World Economic Forum as Davos because that's where it meets, as we know, in January every year. But what few people know is that actually there are two World Economic Forum summits every year, and one of them is in China. So it is deeply involved, the World Economic Forum, uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, 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 and this then, uh, as I say, shows how China has played ideologically and practically uh, an absolutely fundamental role in 
in consolidating, in creating and consolidating globalization in a way which is perfectly compatible with the Marxism, which of course continues to be the official ideology of China. Now, if we're holding this symposium today, it's because this convergence seems to be coming under stress. In June, NATO declared, I won't say declared war on China, but declared China to be uh, a strategic enemy and a danger to the international world system. We all know about the Pelosi visit to Taiwan. Uh, the American political class, we'll hear in a moment from our American speakers, uh, has been to some extent divided on the issue of China. Um, and uh, this is because, Na and, and, and uh, I mentioned this again in July, NATO declared China to be an enemy. The Chinese reacted absolutely furiously. They issued a, a declaration uh, saying that uh, NATO should, uh, uh, was, had, had, had shed blood, had committed crimes, and was uh, uh, you know, waging proxy wars and so on. China, by contrast, had peace. So the convergence seems to be coming under strain. Uh, and uh, that's what I would like uh, our American, um, well, I'm, our American speakers, who I'll introduce in a minute, I'm sure will will talk to us about that. I want to just uh, conclude before uh, passing the floor to uh, our uh, keynote speaker uh, with this uh, very impressive quotation by Henry Kissinger, who is of course always very lucid, and who was, as uh, you all know, the. Uh, the architect of uh, Richard Nixon's famous visit to China in 1972, a visit which we should understand as classic geopolitics. That's not so much the uh, convergence of West and East, it's geopolitics. They wanted to weaken Russia, so they uh, tried to uh, um, court China in its place as a counterbalance and partly succeeded. Now, by contrast, and this will be the subject of our discussion, NATO and the West seems to want to fight Russia and China at the same time, as if that were possible. And Henry Kissinger said this, we are at the edge of war with Russia and China on issues which we partly created without any concept of how this is going to end or what it is supposed to lead to. It's a brilliant remark. Thank you for your attention. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel for regular updates or go to forumfordemocracy.com for more content.